Hello. Welcome back to Pillars of Eternity. I'm going to be using a slightly different setting on OBS. Hopefully the video looks better. If it looks worse, I'm sorry. If it looks the same, that's also acceptable. I'm just trying to get things to run a little smoother on my end. Now what were we doing? Deliver the package to Gareth. Right, right, right. Okay. Oh, crap. Why, why does it do this? With the cat's nose, how is it you failed to notice your rotten stench? Failed to notice? Hardly. I put work into smelling this way. I should have expected. I never know what sort of game is downwind. I need to smell like part of nature, not an interloper. On it. Did we talk to these people? Alright, what's your deal? Some payday this turned into. Good day to you. An old man paces the dock and looks out over the water. He's fussing over something large and round, which he constantly shifts from one hand to the other. You're not certain whether his wide-eyed, gape-mouth expression marks surprise or fear. It seems he isn't, either. You, uh, don't look like a guard. He examines you, and your equipment, more closely. Say, you wouldn't be interested in making some coppers, would you? He shows you the object in his hand. It's a large, round opal with Anguithan ruins carved into it. It glistens with his sweat. I've been looking for someone to help me recover some missing cargo. Tell me more about this missing cargo. He licks his lips. We started in cold morn and were making our way down the river, loading and unloading as we went. Business as usual. What exactly happened? He massages the opal in a clammy palm. When we reached Ina's rest, we may have agreed to, uh, take on a few crates from some place called Cleobon Relag. A couple of the lads snuck a peek at the cargo, saw suits of armor and a broken scepter. He shrugs. Don't know why anyone would want a broken anything, but these animantos will buy dirty stockings if you say they came from the ruins. Horavius blinks three times, his face twitching more each time. So... Aiding and abetting in the looting of Nguithen treasures? The real crime is that I'm not allowed to tear his lungs out through his navel. That was new Horavius dialogue for me. So exciting. <laughs> new Horavius content. Yay! He closes his hand around the opal in a white-knuckled grip. We were almost to Defiance Bay when the screaming started. I've seen my share of barroom brawls, but this sounded different. I was topside with the captain, but he and my first mate went below decks to see what all the commotion was about. When they didn't come back, I looked into the hold. He shudders. I saw one of those suits of armor, walking around all by itself. It was covered in blood. When it saw me, it started running for the hatch. So I closed it. He squeezes his eyes shut. What would Thorn say? This is new to him. He's not used to, you know. One could argue, because, you know, Horavius is uh, Glanfathen, and Glanfathens want to protect the Anguithan ruins and the Anguithan culture. So you could argue that he would be pissed off and calling him pathetic, both for killing his crew and for uh, the looting of the ruins. But, again, Thorn is from an offshoot called the Broken Arrows, which they've abandoned certain certain offshoots of the Broken Arrows, if I remember the lore correctly, don't care quite as much. They would probably be more concerned about the crew being locked up. At the same time, I think Thorn can see that he's... Well... I'm deciding if Thorn would see that he's upset and try to be nice... Well, this is early on on his trip. He's seen some fucked up things, but regular fucked up things. Not so much walking armor. More like, you know, fantasy racism and slavery and poverty, that kind of thing. 
How could you lock your crewmates in the hold with those creatures? Imatol covers his face with his hands. What choice did I have? I couldn't fight them by myself. He rolls the stone between his hands. I'm just a deckhand, but I was the only one left. I piloted the ship as best I could, but I hit the rocks as we were passing Brackenberry. I barely made it to Andra's gift before I had to jump overboard and swim for the docks. I'd given up on the cargo, not to mention the payday, when one of the lads pulled this up in his nets. He shows you the opal again. It's part of that scepter. From what I recall, there were three other pieces, and I'd bet you anything they're somewhere in the shallows, too. If anyone could find them, there'd be profit to follow. I would love to know what that survival check leads to. We'll be back when I have the survival. I don't have time right now. He sighs. Come back if you change your mind. Looks like the Lady of Lament is keeping the rest of the scepter for now. He gazes out over the water. Anything else you need? You know, your name doesn't sound dear wooden. That's because it isn't. I shouldn't have clicked this one. I knew he was going to be from there, and I can't pronounce that. There is one voice actor who sounds like... They have a fucking inkling of how... Examital should be pronounced. And we won't see him for a while. We won't see his character for a while. There is one motherfucker here that I can defin definitively say speaks Spanish. Examital is fantasy Aztec. And I... We're gonna go with Examital. But... I don't think that's quite right. I'm from the Examital Plains, a broad savanna north of the Deerwood. Not so different from the ocean, in a way. There are places where you can stand and turn a full circle and see nothing but the winds making waves in the grass. He catches the surf lapping against the wrecked boat. But at moments like this, I wonder what business a plainsman like me had taking to the water. Farewell. Now have we talked to these guys? Omahadan? As you near, you feel a vibrant history containing the essence of this man's soul. Voices from its past seem to call out to you. You see a man probing at a lock, hunting for the click, click, click of success. It takes him more than a moment, but there it is. Click. He turns the needle further. Click. A smidge more. Click. His smile is all smug self-assurance as he pushes into the well-fortified building. He shivers as he steps over the threshold, pupils contracting briefly as the door swings shut of its own accord behind him. Click, click, click. Locked. He moves to the silent building, no subtlety to his search. He pockets nothing, despite the slack-jawed ache in his face as he passes over jewelry and potions alike. Nobody stops him as he slinks from room to room. He is alone, uninterrupted in his search. Finally, in a dingy, dust-encrusted room he finds a trap door, carelessly hidden beneath a fraying carpet. The lock is rusted, old and crude, and breaks with ease as he takes the sword hilt to it. He whistles through his teeth at the collection before him. Hammers of Audra, obsidian blades, dragon scale armor. He replaces his sword with an enormous symbol blade of black, and takes as much else as he can carry. Dropping the trap door back down, he hears a wailing, piercing screech. Panicking, he tries to run, but his collection is too heavy. He curses, dropping all but the sword, and scales a bookcase to a barred window. He smashes the glass with his sword, and begins to bash at the old iron bars. Shouting in the distance renews his desperation, and with a great clang the bars fall from the window. He squeezes through the opening, every inch of exposed skin cut with glass, and runs, the obsidian blade on his back glowing gently in the in the Dark Knight. Fucking fine. I flubbed that like five times. I'm not doing it again. Who are you? You see a man, lying on a mat, restless in sleep. He tosses about, unable to claim total peace. Beneath his lids, his eyes dart about, and small moans of distress escape his lips. He rolls around, moving from lying on his back to his side to his back again, sweat standing out on his forehead. This is just any time I try to get to sleep. The door to his chamber slowly opens, 
the weak light from the hall outside falling across the sleeping man's face. This man, much younger than he is now, steps lithely into the room. His feet rise and fall as he crosses the floor with calculated precision, never once making a sound. He approaches the man on the mat, slowly raising two daggers as he does. He stands over the man, staring down at him, intense hatred burning behind his rocky features. He doesn't move, a statue poised to strike at the man's bedside. This is just what I imagine is happening when I have my eyes closed in my bed. The man's eyes fly open, blinking in confusion, trying to drive the sleep from his mind. He sees the boy standing over him, daggers at the ready, and the blinking stops. Terror replaces the confusion, and he only has time to say one word. You! Before the boy is on him, he drops, planting a knee on the man's neck, and plunges one of the daggers into his stomach. The boy leans over, tilting his head back to reveal a large black scar that cuts across his neck from the right side of his jawline to his left collarbone. The man gurgles and makes a muffled coughing sound, trying to speak through his crushed windpipe. The boy looks at him again, locking eyes and holding his gaze as the man slowly slips away. He then lifts both daggers and brings them down into the man's eyes. The ropes dangling from the crane sway in the ocean breeze. Well, it's a copper lane, I suppose. Next time we get the chance, I'm buying you a pint. That means a lot to Dare. Oh, do you want one too? Sorry, I meant for Isselmere. I'll get you one too. <sighs> While we're here, let's talk to this kid. He'll give us a side quest. A young boy watches the passerby and counts a grimy handful of coins. His face and arms are smudged with dirt, but except for the grass stains, his clothes are in good condition. As you approach, he blinks and makes a quick, furtive effort to pocket his coins. Hey, mister. Wanna know a secret? He wipes his nose with a sleeve. I know a real good secret. Looks like we got a little hustler here. Someone raised this kid right. Really? What is it? He shrugs and clasps his hands behind his back, kicking a loose pebble. I just saw folks hiding some really neat things. I could show you where, but Mom and Dad told me not to talk to strangers. His eyes slowly roll up to you. But maybe you could help me with something. Then we wouldn't be strangers. Help you with what? Gordy's voice suddenly rises in pitch and tempo. The Crucible Knights have these daggers made out of March steel. It's the best steel around, except for Durgan steel, which doesn't count because no one makes it anymore. He stops long enough to catch his breath. Anyway, there's this merchant, over by the Expedition Hall, and he has a dagger made of real March steel. His eyes grow large and round. He said he wouldn't sell it to me because I'm a kid, and kids don't know anything about daggers. But that's not true. I know lots about daggers. I know about the different kinds of steel. I know how the Crucible Knights make them in a forge. I know that the tip can pierce low-gauge scale armor. That one that's good and sharp can cut through bone. See, I know plenty about daggers. And I really, really want this one. And if you could just get it for me, I promise I'll never, ever ask anyone for anything ever again. I used to have a knife when I was his age. I don't know about... <laughs> I don't know a better way <laughs> I don't know a better way to learn what you should and shouldn't stab. I say we give him a chance. We're gonna do the whole side quest. We're gonna do it. So this sounds reasonable. I'll get it for you. Gordy jumps up and down, whooping and hollering. I knew a real adventurer would understand. He points to a large building. There's a big merchant over by Admus Den who sells weapons. He's the one with the dagger. I'll wait right here for you. His gap tooth grin stretches from ear to ear. What if we just pick up some side quests in this video? Ah, uh, people would probably be bored. Is that Norlin? No, you're a god like you 
fucking piece of shit. I just- I thought I saw pointy ears, it's horns. Uh, what do you got to say? As you near, you feel a vibrant history contained in the essence of this man's soul. Voices from its past seem to call out to you. You see a man cross his arms and stick his chin out. I'm sorry. I don't think what they wrote there is correct. <laughs> you see a man crosses his arms and sticks his chin out? Something about the tenses and the... It, it doesn't... I don't think that's right. Moonlight and torchlight color his face. Bullshit. The elf standing in front of him wears a panicked expression. Are you mad? I've seen it. Aha! The first man cries, raising a triumphant finger. You just said you'd only heard it. The elf blinks. What in the name of Galloway's beasts does that have to do with anything? You said you'd only heard it. Now you're telling me it's a monster the size of two Amawa with blood-dyed fur. The man takes a step closer to the elf. And now I'm saying you're a liar, Doran. Doran sputters. Gods, Viserys. Who cares what it looks like? It's a rabid wolf. You see what it did to the sheep? The elf throws up both of his hands, shaking his head. You want to stay out here all night to see the thing yourself? Have it your way. I'm getting out of here. Fine. All right. Good. The elf storms off, casting one last glance over his shoulder as he disappears down a hill. The man sets off in the other direction, a sword in one hand and a torch in the other. Within minutes, he comes to a broken paddock where a dozen sheep lie dead, their throats torn and their innards scattered across the ground. It is not the work of a normal predator. Something crunches through the dry grass. Viserys spins but sees nothing. He raises his torch higher. This time, a rustling sounds from behind him, near the paddock. He turns again to see a wolf. It's not nearly as large as Doran had sworn, and while its fur is matted with red around its throat and paws, the rest of the elf's description has proven to be a rather lurid exaggeration. Typical. Viserys takes some small satisfaction in this even while the wolf lunges for him, its jaws foaming and eyes rolling. So, I think... The Goose and Fox, I think this is where Gareth is. Ah, Gareth. <laughs> the Stelgar's pelt is thick with dust and moths. The plaque below the beast reads, Maiden Falls, 2682. Hi, Gareth. A man skulks near the bar. He seems like he's trying to blend in with the wood paneling, and he watches the other patrons out of the corner of his eye. He gives you a quick nod as you approach. Verzano has a delivery for you. He glances around and snatches the pouch from you. Keep your voice down, will you? The Dominels have spies everywhere. He tucks the pouch away. You tell Verzano this is the last time I'm buying from him. This is getting too dangerous for me. I don't think I've heard of the Dominels. The more important thing is making sure they don't hear of you. They're old Brackenberry stock. But these days the Dominels are known for their business activities. Most of which involves some degree of bribery, extortion, theft, or murder. Did I just do something illegal? Uh, no? He grins weakly. <laughs> what do the Dominels have to do with this? You have no idea, do you? Let's just say that the Dominels have, uh, exclusive rights to trade certain merchandise within the city. Verzano likes to make some extra coin from time to time by dealing in the same merchandise. Undercutting the competition, he says. Tell me what was in that pouch. Bitter squash seeds. Sorry, my mouth just fell open. They interrupt pregnancies. Even though they're not exactly legal, many folk nowadays prefer them to the risk of hollowborn, or celibacy. He pulls a wry frown. I don't know if we've spent enough time with Horavius in this let's play. Horavius would get someone these. Horavius, if anyone in the party needed these. I don't know, you might be, ha ah, they're all men. They could be transgender. You don't know. You haven't asked. You haven't checked. You have not fucked Kanarua. 
I can say that definitively. Heravius would, would be able to get these, or an equivalent. Also, wow, I don't remember them, like, discussing stuff like abortion. I'm, I'm sure I, 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 I have full faith in Josh Sawyer with this game. He... I will dig and dig through Defiance Bay for more lore about how the squash seeds affect culture. And... I do not expect to be disappointed. I have full faith, and if I'm let down, I'll cry into a microphone for my three viewers on YouTube. Anyway, are we done? Yeah, we're done. Now get out of here before... A woman swaggers in, her polished boots thwacking the floor with slow, deliberate steps. A crooked sneer warps her smooth face. Gareth, I'm hurt. You promised to buy only from me. What's a girl to think? Gareth bows, his knees knocking together. Please, my lady, I was just explaining that I don't do business with anyone else. Except this one last time, right? Dana crosses her arms and rocks back on her heels. There's always one more deal. Until you run out of credit, that is. Dana turns and regards you, looking you up and down. And just who are you? You don't exactly look like a seed dealer. Aloth glances at Gareth. I think that's a compliment. I was just someone making a delivery. Vrezana put you up to this, didn't he? That old fool's on a sinking ship, and he's determined to drag anyone who gets close enough down with him. This is the point where alarm bells are going off. Well, no. Probably when he found out that he was... Breaking the law. Not that I, I think Thorne only cares conditionally about the law. But when he found out he was breaking the law for some old rich Valian, and he didn't even know it. And I think this line would probably be what, what made it click in his head. That, oh, oh, fuck for Zano, actually. Because I think Thorne's been pushed around by so many old rich Valians and probably done so many shady odd jobs. That at this point, he's fucking sick of them. Because how, how wouldn't Orlin get, you know, decent work in the Valian Republic? Sorry, this might mean nothing to you. She eyes the trembling Gareth. Gareth here knew better, but I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. In fact, I'll also give you a chance to get even with the imbecile who's been playing us both. She narrows his eyes. What do you say to killing Vritsano? Why would I want to do that? Why wouldn't you? He's used you to do his dirty work, and without telling you anything about what you were carrying, or who you were crossing. She taps a finger to her jaw, and her voice slows. Of course, I'd also consider it a personal favor. And how Stominel is never stingy with its friends. She glances at Gareth. The loyal ones, anyway. Tell me about the Dominels. I don't know whether to be relieved or insulted. We're one of the wealthiest merchant families in Defiance Bay. Let's just say, however, that some of our business practices are not officially sanctioned. Sure, man. It's sanctioned, I know. Whoops, fucked it up. Gareth groans and stifles a sob. I don't know. I think, I think Thorne would want everyone to survive this scenario. Which puts me between four and five. Here's the argument with not picking, um, lying. What if she notices and then tries to kill us? Picking five, the worst she'll do is say, that's not good enough, you have to make a decision. So, I'll decide his fate when I talk to him again. You better make up your mind quickly, because we're going to pay him his dues one way or another. Just make sure you stay out of her way. Let's uh, check out a couple more backer characters. Like Arishti. You see a fire burning slowly on the side of a winding road, unmanned. There seems to be no fuel, no wood or oil for it to consume, no hay or twigs. Despite this, it roars, crackles, wails in the wind. It takes you a moment, but you begin to notice a figure in the flames. Its shaking hands cradle a young face. 
molten red tears marring skin the color of coal. The boy cowers, flame coating him as he holds his knees to his chest. In the distance, a man approaches, faceless. He extends a hand to the frightened child, who considers it warily before taking it. The flames die down, leaving his limbs and settling on his head like obedient pets. All tears dried, they walk together, fire and death, hand in hand. As you're near, you feel a vibrant history containing the essence of this man's soul. You see a wizard playing illusions in a town square, fingers plucking color and sound from the air and weaving scenes of beauty and fright. A crowd of onlookers gasps and cheers, enthralled with the display. All but one boy, standing off to the side, mouth agape. Green eyes are pale with wonder, vision after vision playing out before him. And something inside the boy clicks. Without warning, he bolts, disappearing into the crowd, pushing and shoving desperately. The mage finishes his show soon after, a giant silver dragon descending through the crowd and a thousand stars exploding into nothingness. Collecting coins, he walks around the clapping crowd, bowing and nodding at each as he passes, until a small sack is dropped into his hands. The boy stands for a moment before him, small and still, and begs the wizard to apprentice him. He glances at the hefty bag, weighing it, and the boy, carefully. Finally, he nods and flicks gently at the bag, which disappears. The boy grins. How'd you do that, he asks, but the illusionist merely winks. <laughs> and finally, the vulture. You see a hand, curled and bruised, staked to the floor with a bent metal spike. Blood covers the floor and drips from the furnishings and walls. This man looks up from the body he is crouched over to survey the carnage he caused to the family in whose house he now skulks. Four bodies total. A woman, two young men, and a girl lie blindfolded on the ground. Their legs are bound and both hands are attached to the floor with spikes. He has lifted the woman's blindfold and is currently doing something to her eyes. He pulls back a small blade and covers the eyes again gently patting the blindfold. He stands and looks around, seemingly satisfied with his handiwork. Suddenly his breath quickens, hearing someone approach the door to the room. He bounces in place, excitement almost overwhelming him, then rushes to the back of the room, concealing himself in the shadows. From his vantage, he sees the bodies are perfectly arranged, each one facing the door, welcoming the man of the house back arms outstretched as if in embrace. The door opens as he slowly pulls another spike from his belt, the tip of his tongue playing across his teeth in anticipation. That's a scary thought, coming home to your your whole family. Orlin! Oh, wouldn't that be- it would be so scary. Hey, here's an Orlin. As you're near, you feel a vibrant history contain the essence of this man's soul. You see an impressive gathering of wild Orlins in ceremonial dress, shaded by a copse of ancient oaks. Underneath the largest oak stand two young Orleans, hands clasped, eyes clear as they promise to care for and love one another in the joining of their clans. An older Orlin steps towards them to speak, beard seeming to sprout from directly underneath his eyes, and declares their union complete. The jubilant Orlin clans carry the newly wedded couple away to their tent with snorts of laughter and crude jokes, leaving the older Orlin to sit alone beneath the age-old oak. He sighs observing the scene in the distance. He whispers a quiet benediction, glad for their gladness, and melts into the trees without another word. He has seen enough happiness for one day. <sighs> Orleans. The miserable, that miserable bastard. I have to look at this first. A dragon is outlined in charcoal pencil. The thick, jagged lines, and the faint smell of sulfur suggests that the artist completed the sketch in a hurry. Cliff Dragon, White March, 2685. And what's your deal, ma'am? A woman sits by herself, spinning something on the table in front of her and watching it with furious intensity. It's about the size of a coin, and it wobbles over a crack in the wood with a metallic rattle. 
She snatches it up with one hand and slams a half-empty cup down on the table with the other. This is not a good time. You look like you could use another drink. I'll get there. She takes a long drink from her glass, just trying to calm down and trying to talk myself out of doing something foolish. Something foolish? She says nothing for a few moments, as if hoping you'll leave. At last, Kanemar looks up at you, and lamplight falls across her face. A purpling bruise is blossoming along her cheekbone. There's something I need to give to my fiancé, Pernisk. Only, he doesn't seem to go anywhere without his new friends, and they're not exactly pleasant company. I think Thorne would have enough discretion to not ask that. So, we'll just say, tell me about these new friends. They come into our house with their dead eyes and their black teeth. I'm not a fool, I know what it means. Pernisk makes me leave when they show up, but it's obvious what they come to do. Last time they came, I told them to get out. Let them have their fun somewhere in the gift, but not under my roof. She scowls and then winces her fingertips gently probing her bruise. Svef changes you, I guess. The Pernis guy knew wouldn't have squashed a spider. I never thought he'd... She trails off, still feeling the swollen, discolored flesh. But Svef makes people calm and listless. It shouldn't make them violent. Kanra shrugs. I don't really know. Seemed better than believing he's always been this way. Maybe I could go talk to him. Her hand rests on the table, and she clenches it into a white-knuckled fist. There's nothing more to say to him. We're finished. I just want to give this back to him and have a clean break. She opens her hand, and a ring clatters onto the table. It was his grandmother's. Even after this, I don't have the heart to sell it off. But if I go back there myself, I know what'll happen. I lose my temper, and I'll probably wind up with another one of these. She points to her bruise. I wouldn't normally hand this off to a stranger, but people say you've got a good heart. If you give this back to him, he'll know we're done. I'll take this ring to Pernisk, then. She looks at you and nods. The house is just north of here. Just... please don't hurt him. As furious as I am, I don't want that on my conscience. Wait, there's something to look at over here. Probably not allowed back here, but what the hell. A dwarf and an orlin debate philosophy on the other side of the court of the curtain. <laughs> oh, to be there! Oh, to be, oh, to be debating philosophy with a dwarf and an orlin. Oh, Josh Sawyer, you paint such beautiful mind pictures for me. What's this? This painting depicts Glenfathen ruins, and the canvas bears the rough brushstokes of a talented amateur. It rules well. Twenty six sixty five. Thorne would love this, by the way. Thorne would look at all the paintings. Thorne would be staring at the paintings. Thorne would be really, like, taking in the paintings. He'd be chewing on them. Who's this? Brad? You see a mud-soaked clearing. Rain falling to the ground in large drops. This man is lying on his back in the muck. His hands holding open the maw of an enormous Stelgar that stands over him. Its front paws on his chest. The heavy rain falls over them, playing counterpoint to the grunts made by the opponents. Dead Stelgar litter the ground around them, and the man's body shows signs of a difficult battle. His clothing is torn, hanging in scraps in some places. Bites and scratches cover his arms and legs. A huge gash cuts across his forehead, blood and water mixing as they run down his face and drip into the mud. It takes all the man's effort to keep the beast's jaws from clamping down. The man looks wildly until his gaze finally lands on a large axe lying barely within arm's reach behind his head the rain slowly covering it with grime and muddy water. He looks at the Stelgar and then back at his axe, grim determination on his face. His arms are shaking, and it seems he will not be able to hold the beast back for much longer. He takes a deep breath and wraps his right hand around the Stelgar's bottom jaw, then lets go with his left hand, freeing the top of its head. The Stelgar's mouth snaps shut on the right hand as his left shoots out above his head and grabs the handle of the axe. The Stelgar grinds its teeth and pulls back trying to free itself from his grip, blood dripping from its mouth onto his face. With a grunt that quickly becomes a bellow of pain, the man pulls his right hand down, 
bringing the beast's head closer to him, swinging the axe around as he does. The blade of the weapon pierces the Stelgar's neck and it yelps, its mouth popping open as it tries to step backward off the man. Before his mangled hand can lose its grip, the man pulls and twists as hard as he can, trying to get the beast on the ground, using the Stelgar's resistance to pull himself into a sitting position. He brings the axe down on its neck again, and again, and one final time as its head and his hand simultaneously come free. The head flies from his grip as he thrusts his hand behind his back to brace himself as he falls. As his hand hits the ground and his full weight lands on it, a second bellow of pain erupts from his mouth. Breathing heavily, he brings his now mangled hand up to assess the damage. The little finger is gone, lost somewhere in the mud. The two fingers next to it are twisted, broken, and torn, barely attached to his hand by small bits of flesh. He sighs, grabbing both dangling fingers with his left hand. He grits his teeth and pulls. That's also what I would do. If, like, part of me was just hanging off by a little tiny bit. I know that people can reattach fingers and stuff, but I would just be like, fuck it, man. I don't, I, I don't have the money for that. Let's just deal with the wound. Also, this guy sounds like an asshole. I mean, I would get... I would get killing Stelgar that are menacing like a small village or a farm or whatever if there's like a whole pack of them bothering people. But like the way this is written, it really sounds like he just he just goes out and mangles himself to, to hunt big game. What a fucking loser, am I right? Not for food, not for the protection, just for the hell of it. Ravius would be the last person to steal ale. I'll tinker with that. What could go wrong? Bartender's ring. 20% damage against spirit. Oh, this is really good. Should I just... I'm gonna have to take this. That's a lot of will. The simple wooden ring is orange and gray, and it glows when you're not wearing it. The ring's actual history is more speculation than fact. While all sources agree that it was owned by Errol of Levy, and that he acquired it after a period of exile. Stories differ on the particulars of how he got it. Some say it was a gift from one of the gods, and others say it was the boon of a pact he made with a wicked power. Is it, is it in my inventory? Where is it? Okay, Heravius has it. That's, that's fine. Now, Will... Hold on, where's the stats? Stats, stats, stats. No, okay. I thought that Will was a whole thing. That, that's Thistle stats, okay. I, I I was really upset for a second. I was gonna be like, Thorn doesn't have five intelligence. I thought that Will was its own- Whoa. Let's just walk into a couple buildings. Like I said, I did want to pick up side quests anyway. We'll give that to you for now. Let's walk around a bit. If you were hoping I'd finish anything up today, you, uh... You're gonna have to wait. I'm sorry. Did we talk to Roy? No. You see a half-consumed ale slosh its way across the distance to his mouth, spilling across the stains of food long past. Glazed eyes glance at the brawl across the room, gaining fervor as the fight extends through the room. Another ale, he murmurs to the bartender, downing his drink and turning towards the hall. He pulls out a picture from his pockets, a painting of a young child, all brown hair and green eyes, and holds it above a candle. It does not burn. Ales later, he begins to sing, the bar a mess of broken chairs and wounded pride, and they all listen for a moment before continuing their drinks, sveph, conversations. His ache is felt through the room. His sad story reminds them of their sad stories. When he finishes singing, a silence hangs in the air, palpable among the smoke and the sweat and the yeasty smell of beer-infused exhalation. He's the first to break the silence, ordering a round of ale for the room. The general din of conversation sparks and resumes, but the mirth is now tempered with far-off memories and thoughts. What's up here? 
Aleph has already leveled up. We'll be back here, don't worry. Oh, we're gonna come back later. I don't want to read these backer characters. My throat's a little froggy. We'll have to come back anyway later for something. No spoilers. Let's see. There was that guild hall, right? Didn't the Dozens guy say we should go to somewhere? I really, because every, everyone's so close to a level up. I just want to get, was it Horavius and Kana, I think it was. I just want to get them over that lip. Uh, let's go over here. I've never been here anyway. I mean, I've never been in here. Admus Den. The dozens may not like us foreigners much, but they certainly don't mind taking our coin. That is a nice map. That is pretty. No Orleans. Unless that's an Orlin. A well-groomed man steps through the hall with a confident swagger, a smug grin etched on his face. He is flanked by five other hard-looking individuals. One of his companions eyes you for a moment before spitting chew at your feet. Another pup come wandering in, I see. Just know that Bynes Giant Slayers run things around here and you'll be fine. Never heard of him. His eyes narrow. You have now. Stick around Defiance Bay and you will again. Plenty of bounties to go around. But there's a reason the Giant Slayers get the lion's share. Remember that. A voice bellows across the hall. Enough jabber, Bine. You gonna do the job or talk about it? His jaw tightens. Wayne's right. That coin ain't going to collect itself. He looks to his comrades and jerks his chin towards the door. See you around, pup. These are the sort of rivals you would find in an, adv in an, adv an adventure zone arc. Daggers mark the locations of various Anguithan ruins. Notes posted around the map list bets on current expeditions. Oh no, Haravius isn't going to like this. And in general, I bet they're... I said they were racist. I told you they were racist. You should have trusted me. Why didn't you trust me? <laughs> if they hate Glanfathans, and Glanfathans are largely Orlans, they're going to extend that hate onto other Orlans, because I know that the writers have the competence to know that that's how that would work. Keep your guard up, or I'll give you something to guard, damn you. Arrows are for practice in the expedition hall only. Purchase weapons for personal for personal use from Son Sonald. Oh my god, no exceptions. Osric. That stance is gonna get you killed. Have you even held a weapon before? Put some weight into that swing. The edges of these swords have been blunted for practice. I guess we have to talk to this guy. For the last time, Aidwig, keep your fucking blade up. Whoa! If that dummy was armed, it'd have your head off. <laughs> I forget that in this game, for I've played a lot of M-rated games, and they're usually really sparing with the cursing. For some reason, not this one. If it's funnier, or shows more emotion to put fuck in there, they're gonna put fuck in there. It's great. I love it. It's great. This man watches the training adventurers with a disinterested contempt of someone whose skills are wasted in this setting. He barks at one of them. Bye. I thought he'd give me a quest or something. I guess I could have asked him about the hall. There, there's other backer characters here. Right now I'm looking for, for stuff to look at, really. 
See, there's Sonild. You got any quests for me? Well met, friend. Oh my god, it's all stealing and Gwyth and ruins. Isn't it? Oh. Oh no, we're gonna have to kill all these people, aren't we? For her obvious, I mean. The woman looks up from polishing a dagger. Haven't seen you before. You headed out with an expedition company. She raises an eyebrow. Or are you betting on one? How long have you worked at Admeth's Den? She leans on the countertop and drums her fingers. Oh, a few years. I got in the minute the last merchant cleared out. She nods toward the main area of the hall. They've got new expeditions venturing out every week, so this is a great place to do business. And the dozens make loyal friends, and loyal customers, so long as you stick by them. She taps the counter. The vendor who was here before me. They ran him out when he sold his best helms to a pair of crucible knights. I've been careful not to make the same mistake. Tell me about the expeditions. They're groups of adventurers that venture into the wilderness. More than a few of them try their luck scouring the ruins. Most of them come back empty-handed, if they come back at all. Betting on them is almost as risky as actually going. But that's how the expeditions get funded. And every once in a while, one of the adventuring companies will strike it big and make a fortune for their backers. Farewell. Oh. Oh no. Haravis is going to tell me to kill these people, and I'm going to do it without question. Hey, y'all got any books? I'll I can do that. that. What could go wrong? All done. That's so Haravius, leveling up after stealing a lock and taking some things from some bigots. What's this map? This map marks areas of geological activity in the Deerwood and Air Glanfath. Of note is a description of a cavern where molten rock throws within a deep chasm. You need that. And it's a it's a it's a pain in the ass to find. I wonder. No. Yes. I think that's what I'm thinking of. Or no, no, it's it's off of Anslog's compass what I'm thinking of. It's something to do with a um a companion quest later on. I have to have for obvious uh, steal from these guys. I'm sorry. All done. It's just too in character. It's too correct. He can't use that, but he's gonna take it anyway. He could use it. I just don't think it's the best idea. Oh, his health is um in the yellow. That's not good. I wish I could zoom in. I know the character model's not great, but. Oh, this little guy. Anyway. See? See, it's this shit. It's this shit. This is so much. All at once. And I'm sure that makes druids an amazing class to have. I'm sure that makes Haravius one of the most valuable party members in the game, and I'm so happy about that because I love him. But Jesus Christ. That's like, what, eight new spells? Two, four, six... Yeah, eight new spells that I have to learn. They want me to learn all at once? I, I'm, I'm never gonna remember this. Um, let's talk to this guy. Don't stand on ceremony. State your business. The rough-looking man glances at you briefly as he scans the mercenaries milling about the room. Tell me about the dozens. Wayne's expression becomes serious, the timber of his voice deepening. Good men and women trying to walk in the footsteps of great men and women who came before us. We're a loose association of warriors and expeditionaries in the Deerwood. Not as fancy as the Crucible Knights, mind you, but at least we remember our roots. At least they remember someone else's roots and pretend to be like them, he means. Your roots? Everyone knows that the Saints' War ended when the God Hammer destroyed Widewin at Avon Dewar Bridge. A lot of folks don't know how Widewin wound up on that bridge. Seven men. Five women. They walked out of Halgut Citadel and faced down a god. Held him there until the bomb went off. He thumps the table. That's the legacy we defend. Some call us mercenaries, but we don't need matching armor and silky cloaks to remember our roles. We're the same now as we were then. We stand up for the people. First line of defense, whatever it takes. 
We got new enemies now. If it's not Widewin, it's his damned legacy. It's the damned Soul Butchers and Brackenberry making things worse on all of us. Probably causing the whole thing, one way or another. Well, we haven't gone anywhere, and there's a lot more than twelve of us now. We defended the Deerwood once. We'll do it again. It's so scary. It's so scary hearing them talk. Because, like, even in the game, they don't know what caused the legacy. I do, because I played the game before, but I, I don't, I'm not in the game. If only I were blessed enough to wake up in Aeora one day. They're just blaming Widewin because he was the enemy in this war that they weren't even involved in. Probably. Most of them weren't involved in. And we can infer from how Adair talks that the people he sees obviously weren't fighting with him because he was there. It, it, it's, it's like, you know, modern American terrorist groups and like alt-right and hyper-conservative groups. They talk about standing up for the people being the first line of defense, walking in their forefather's footsteps, which in a way they are by being massive fucking bigots. And you can, you can see just hints of it. Like oh, our, our new enemies, it's um, it's something intangible but our enemy caused it. It's the people in the asylum. They're the evil ones. They're doing evil things. It does get a little messy, that last part, with Brackenberry, because of the abuses that go on within mental institutions, you know, from the, the doctors to the patients. But, you know, the game talks about that in a mature and empathetic enough way that... I don't, I don't think the way they're, the way Wayanen and his group are seeing the asylum, the way the game's seeing the asylum, the way the player's meant to see the asylum, I don't think those are the same thing. I think Wayanen would probably be just as terrified of the patients. I think he'd probably be terrified of the patients and he'd blame the, uh, the doctors, both the, the good and the bad ones. Um for the way the patients are. Kind of like how, uh, you know, like conservatives say that, that it's, you know, therapy and over-medication that's making, making people worse, worsening mental illness. That there's, you know, an epidemic of people being diagnosed with ADHD and autism. Too many men are going to therapy, that kind of thing. I think probably it's supposed to learn, me, learn more towards that. I've been recording for like an hour. My brain... It's, it's, and it's like morning. Ugh, gross. My brain's fried. Let's, let's just keep going. I hope I made a point there or said something entertaining. I hope all my waffling, I hope you got something out of it. Anyway, let's just continue. Wayneen casually nods your way. His eyes continue to float from mercenary to mercenary as he speaks. What else do you need? I don't want to do an expedition, but I would be interested in learning more about the dozens by, uh, I don't... I, no, just farewell. I don't think Thorn would want to work for them right now. We'll check it out later. Assuming that other quests don't uh, bar us from this. I don't want to steal right in front of them. I don't know if we'll get in trouble. I don't really want to get in trouble. We're due for some uh, banter. Huh? We're due for banter. We had Durrance being an asshole, but... If you opened a crate and you found a single preserved beer in it, uh, open like this in a, in a stein, what would you do? I would leave it. I think anyone would leave it. The shields have been battered and scarred in long ago battles. A cat. Take it. Take the cat. It's no one's cat. Take the cat. Damn it. In Deadfire, it's great. You just find random animals and pick them up. I know that's how some of the animals in this work, too, but... Uh, is anyone else close to level up? Adair, yeah. Okay. Oh, ooh. Adair Endurance. Um, let's check out the library. We're not fucking around in the library today. We'll pick up another side quest. Don't you worry. I'm not gonna read every book yet. I'll save that for its own discreet video. 
And then anyone interested in hearing me read out every little bit of lore in the the Defiance Bay Library can just go right to that. All these pages serve no better use than fuel for the fire. I wish Aravius had talked instead of you. That could be good. If someone's menacing Aloth or whoever. Um. We'll also be getting a new... We'll be getting a paladin companion soon. So that'll be another melee damage. We're not sure how we'll do the party setup. But we'll go with Into the Fray for now. Welcome to the Hall of Revealed Mysteries. Well met, friend. The woman barely glances up from the tomes on the table as you approach. You're welcome to browse the stacks, but mind that you keep your voice down. This is still a temple, after all, and Grimda doesn't tolerate disorder. Who's Grimda? Fexa speaks reverently. Why, she's the High Archivist. She's one of the most accomplished scholars alive today. Nothing goes on here without her knowing about it. Almost nothing, anyway. She scratches behind her ear. You should probably tread lightly around her today. Anything else? Tell me about yourself. She throws her broad shoulders back. I am a scrivener and devotee of Weil. It is my duty to look after our records and resources. Her chest swells with pride. This is a temple. It looks like a library. Her eyes grow wide and round. That's because it is! <laughs> Weil is the god of mysteries and answers, encryption and decryption, concealment and revelation. She raises her hands to the rows of shelves. Its guidance comes from the understanding of the unknown and the protection of hidden knowledge. The Hall of Revealed Mysteries was built to celebrate that. To think there's such a place in the Deerwood. Incredible. I'd love a glimpse of the archives. How many secrets must sit upon these shelves? Fascinating. Isn't it? Temples dedicated to Wyle tend to hold vast stores of knowledge. We use that knowledge to unravel and preserve the mysteries of the world. Farewell. Is it all... What are you? You're a dwarf, aren't you? What about you? Elf, I think? Ooh. We'll read about you later. I can't read you right now, Johnny. Yeah, I'll just do a whole video that's just reading everything in here. The Travels of Errol of Levi. 2662 to 2680. <laughs> that's fun, and we heard him mentioned earlier in that ring. Keep searching. The obscure leaves clues for those who seek. Gods keep you. An elderly dwarf surveys the stacks. Her skin looks as tough and wrinkled as a walnut. Despite her stature, she manages to look down her nose at you. That makes sense, because... Orlins are smaller than dwarves. I, I know, most player characters won't be smaller than a dwarf, but still. You're welcome to look around, but let the priests and scriveners continue their search. She shoots the nearest robed figure a withering glance. Wouldn't do to give them other excuses. What are they looking for? Maybe I could find it. She sizes you up, stroking her chin. Could you now? She scowls at the robed priests again. You certainly couldn't do worse than this lot, anyway. Thieves made off with an ancient scroll of wile. They intend to blaspheme by selling that which should remain hidden. And that is a really cool depiction of the eye... Horavius is on his eye patch is a lot simpler, which makes sense because he had to embroider it himself right after losing his eye. And he probably wasn't used to the depth change. But that is a that is a nice way for it to look because it is it's still an eye, which you can only make an eye look so unique, but all the different shapes kind of interlocking like that. Very nice. Up there, I mean. Should I should I have my mouse over there? That big eye there is what I'm talking about. Let's get back to it. 
her wiry eyebrows arch over her spectacles. The guards caught one of them, but were overzealous in their interrogation. All they could piece together was something about a farmhouse and the road to Deerford. Track the thieves down. I don't care what you do with them, but bring back the scroll. Wyle rewards the persistent seeker, and so do I. An ancient scroll of Wyle. There's a fine prize. I mean, a worthy task. What else do you need? Farewell. My throat hurts. I'm going to go one more place. There is, I believe, a tavern and an inn that we have not been to, and we should probably rest. Because knowing me, I'm going to go to complete a quest in the next video, and we're going to get in a really difficult fight, and I don't really want anyone dying. I know I have save scum for Heravius, and I will save scum for Heravius, but he's the only one I'm affording that to. He's my special little guy. He's my sultan, my sultwin, my sweet cheese, my good time boy. If anyone else dies, we'll just let them die, and I'll be sad about it. But I'm not gonna, you know, undo anything. Uh, Brackenberry, I believe, has an inn. No, no. What's impressive is cleaving a man's spine without lopping the head clean off. That takes aim. Did that once. My case was an accident, and I still wake up some nights feeling bad for him. <laughs> I wonder if there's preference to Heravius having a uh, banter because he's in the leader slot. I wonder if that changes anything. The charred barrel. I believe this is an inn. I mean, we did see Isil. We had Aloth and Adair. We had Heravius Durance and Heravius Adair. That is still leaning towards Heravius, but I'm not sure. More data is needed. Let's level up this fuck, and we're gonna get 18 new spells from him, probably, too. And I'm gonna be like, oh, Christ. I might just swap him out to not have to deal with him. What did I say? What did I just say? It's just a lot. I'm sure this is all good and useful. And I'm sure they intentionally made Durance useful because he sucks. And that's the point. You're supposed to hate him. He's named Endurance. You're supposed to view him as a test of endurance like the player does. To an extent. You're also supposed to think he's funny, I'm sure. Each plate and utensil has been polished to a spotless shine. The thin stemmed goblets ring melodiously at the strike of a fingernail. Stop putting your nails on fucking cups, Aloth. That's not like you. Begging your part to Oh! It's you. It's good to see you well. We had a few rough days here, but then we found this place, and they were kind enough to hire us both. Things have been wonderful. I can't tell you how much we appreciate what you've done. If you don't remember, that is the woman, one half of the couple we helped back before we could get Heravius when we were stuck doing side quests before Ked knew it, with the bear, the abusive husband, remember? Hail, traveler. The man is dressed in neat but functional clothes. His sun-wrinkled skin and limber musculature reflect a life spent in the wilderness. Well met. What brings you to the charred barrel? Can I sleep? Let's see your rooms. We're gonna go with that. I don't know if we're gonna fuck with any ciphers, but plus ten will is, um, too tantalizing for me to resist. And I think that's it. We're gonna call it there. Um, next video, we'll finish off some of these side quests we've collected. We'll read more backer characters. Take a look around the charred barrel before anything else. We'll get a new companion. Lots of fun shit in store. As always, thank you for watching. And, good night.